This week on The Other Side, Peter Dutton hits his stride. Uh, is any Australian better off today than they were two years ago? No. They've created a housing crisis, they've created an energy crisis. Uh, we've got anemic growth in the economy. We're going through the fifth quarter now of negative growth in per capita GDP. Businesses are closing. Kowtowing to China again, Labor will never learn that their comrades in Beijing won't respect their weakness, only strengths. Other side, regular and natural law expert Rob McMullen will join me to talk about the feminisation of our culture and the emasculation of Australian men and manhood and what it means for our future freedom, prosperity and security. That's going to be a very interesting discussion. And where are things at in the Ukraine war? And what does it all mean for Australia? Quite a lot more than you might think. We'll bring you up to date and explain why. G'day Perth, g'day Rockhampton, g'day Australia. This is episode 318 of The Other Side for the weekend commencing Friday, June 21, 2024. I'm Damien Curry, and this is our second last show for season one of 2024 before we'll be taking a much needed winter break. We'll tell you more about that next week. But welcome to the show that brings you a summary of the best bits of news and commentary from the week that was through a small government, classical liberal, centre-right view of the world, the sensible centre, we hope. And we're totally open and transparent about our perspective on things, unlike news organisations that pretend to be neutral when they are anything but. We have opinions, but we tell you where they're coming from so you don't mistake our opinions for the absolute truth. This show is for smart people who like to have their views challenged, not just reinforced. But we really hope you agree with most of it. Our goal is to make sure Aussies have the chance to hear a range of different voices, not just the ones approved of by the mainstream media. And that's why we call this show The Other Side. Well, the big news this week was that the Liberal National Party Coalition has announced that they will make nuclear power a core part of Australia's energy strategy moving into the next decade. Before we analyse this, we're going to do something no other news channel does in Australia. We're actually going to shut up and let you hear how the leader of the opposition, Peter Dutton, actually made the original announcement and explained it all on Wednesday. The future of our country is incredibly important and we need to have a plan for the economy, we need to have a plan for jobs and we need to have a plan for cheaper electricity. Uh, the Prime Minister has no vision for our country because he can't manage the government day to day. We've done an enormous amount of work. I want to pay tribute to Ted O'Brien. We've looked at the international experience. We've looked at why Australians are paying the highest electricity prices in the world. We've looked at the expert advice from the regulator who's now telling us that under Labor's renewables only policy, there is a greater likelihood of blackouts and brownouts. Uh, we know that uh, the government has a renewables only policy which is just not fit for purpose. No other country in the world can keep the lights on 24-7 with the renewables only policy. We need to make sure that hospitals can stay on 24-7. We need to make sure that cold rooms can stay on 24-7. We need to make sure that our economy can function 24-7 and we can only do that with a strong baseload power. Oh my God, what just happened? Somebody's turned up in Canberra who has some common sense. It's incredible. I can hardly believe my ears. Hallelujah. Today we announce uh, seven locations uh, that we have looked at uh, in great detail over a long period of time uh, that can host uh, new uh, nuclear sites and that will be part of an energy mix, obviously with renewables and uh, significant amounts of, uh, of gas into the system, particularly in the interim period. Uh, it will mean that uh, on those end-of-life coal-fired power station sites, uh, we can utilise the existing distribution network. This is a really important point. Yes, it is a really important point. The use of the existing old coal power station sites is the most logical approach. Why? Because that's where all the infrastructure already is. It's the most sensible and cost-effective way of doing it so that we don't need to wreck the landscape and build more infrastructure for transmission lines poles and wires, as Peter Dutton calls it. Labor has promised 28,000 kilometres of new poles and wires. Uh, there's no transparency about where that will go. And we've been very clear about the fact that we don't believe in that model. Uh, we want to utilise the existing assets that we've got. And the poles and wires 
uh, that are used at the moment on the coal-fired power station sites uh, can be util utilised uh, uh, to distribute the energy generated uh, from the latest generation nuclear reactors. Uh, we have the ability um, to do that in a way that, uh, that renewables can't. Bravo. Folks, we need to understand one thing. The renewables lobby pretend like they're the good guys, the white knights saving the planet and the evil fossil fuel industry are the baddies manipulating the market to their ends and influencing the politicians with money. No, the industry that has the most power in energy today and the most money is the renewables industry, specifically the wind and solar crowd. They've sought to demonise nuclear and they've tried to get more and more and more government subsidies to support their preferred technology that in many cases is unproven and underdeveloped. I won't name names, but you don't have to dig too far to see which politicians and ex-politicians have been pushing that barrow and which political parties start with the colour teal and keep moving towards the green end of the political spectrum. Nuclear power is now safe, it's efficient, it's proven, and it's absolutely perfect for a country like Australia to make itself energy independent and most importantly, safe and secure. We have a vision for our country to deliver cleaner electricity, cheaper electricity and consistent electricity. This is a plan for our country which will underpin a century of economic growth and jobs for these communities. The infrastructure already exists not only in these sites where the existing power stations are, but around these sites too, in the communities that support them. It's such a relief to see an adult approach to energy policy finally. Labor and the Greens were completely prepared to steamroll ahead on a wing and a prayer with their drive to wind and solar, hoping that maybe in the future the tech would catch up with the passion and maybe we might be able to secure baseload power and keep the lights on and business and manufacturing moving and Australian energy secure and safe. Well, I'm sorry, I don't like emotionally, ideologically driven Greens and lefties taking bets on our economic security and military security, thanks. So it's great to see the LNP finally finding some fortitude and getting in there with a serious plan. Because maybe just isn't good enough. Uh, there's no sense pretending that our economy can operate without a stable energy system. Uh, and our plan today, which will include uh, these seven sites, uh, uh, is integral to the energy roadmap for our country uh, into the future. The assets will be owned by the Commonwealth, uh, a very important point. Many of Peter Dutton's top team members spoke at the announcement, including the former Environment Minister Susan Lay, who's now the Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party and the Opposition Spokesperson for Industry and Small Business. How can this Prime Minister promise a future made in Australia when he can't keep the lights on today. In order to have that future made in Australia, we have to have nuclear energy in the mix. Susan Lay also makes a really important point about the real state of our country's manufacturing industries because of a lack of clarity on energy. You know, not knowing whether energy will be consistent and reliable and secure in the years ahead has really taken its toll on planning and investment for many businesses, and that has been terminal. We have seen the number of manufacturers going to the wall triple since Labor came into government. Insolvencies in manufacturing and construction are at record highs, higher than they've been since the global financial crisis. This is not good enough. The opposition spokesman for energy, Ted O'Brien, said Labor's management of energy has been appalling. They put Australia's energy security at risk by putting all their eggs in one basket, renewables, and they're simply not delivering. Renewables have stalled under Labor. Gas is being suffocated with a lack of supply. And we have 90% of Australia's 24-7 baseload power exiting the grid over the next decade, with no chance of a replacement being ready in time. Labor is turning off one system before having another one ready to go. Australia's running out of energy. 90% of Australia's baseload power exiting the grid over the next decade. That is astounding and grossly irresponsible when you don't have a replacement in place. A country that exports uranium to power other countries' nuclear power plants when we don't have any of our own? 
That is a luxury of silliness that we can no longer afford to indulge. I want to see a strong Australia and a secure Australia that is energy independent from countries like China. I want to see an Australia that has a thriving manufacturing sector and can build things without having to rely on imports from other countries for everything. The critics of this policy mainly have political motives, like the Labor Party, who just want to defend their own failure to get an energy plan in place that won't put us all at massive risk. Well, they have business motives, like former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull of the company Turnbull Renewables, which obviously could do without the competition nuclear will bring. On a much more serious front, leading business figures have suggested that all this uncertainty makes it difficult for the big energy companies to know how to plan and invest. Well, this could all be solved by government butting out as much as possible and allowing the free market to play out. Let all these technologies compete. Let investors work out their own levels of risk that they're prepared to take. Nobody is entitled to government protection in the energy business any more than any other business. Nuclear will not work if it's not economic, same as wind and solar. Some government incentives might be needed to get things moving and get infrastructure in place, but that shouldn't involve a bias towards or any protectionism for any particular technology or special interest group. That is how the free market gets the best outcomes. Let them compete, get out of the way. Innovations may emerge that we haven't even thought of yet. And at least with that agnostic approach, the problem we will have will be that there will be too much electricity, not not enough electricity. Given the utter fiasco that the NBN became, I think we've all learned our lesson about where former Prime Minister Turnbull's advice should go when it comes to massive infrastructure projects and policy in this country. Getting energy right is fundamental to getting our whole country right. And what Peter Dutton has done this week is demonstrate at least some of the leadership that we've so long lacked and which we so desperately need. If he keeps this up, he'll be Prime Minister with a huge majority by next May. Did you know lots of Aussie YouTubers have to make American content to survive? We want to keep producing Aussie news, and to do that, we need your help. If you'd like to advertise on our show, please get in touch in the comments below or DM us on Twitter. Our Australian content means we deliver a mostly Aussie audience. Or if you'd just like to help us out with a donation, please click on the super thanks button with the little dollar sign and the word thanks right under the video frame here on YouTube. Or just click the subscribe button and bell. That's all free and that really does help us out too. Uh, and also follow us on X at other side Oz, AUS. Thank you. There may be nothing more stupid, selfish, or plainly moronic than people who deface art or think that disrupting a live show is a good way to go about winning support for their cause. Jerry Seinfeld has been touring Australia this week, and I guess because he's a Jewish American and supports Israel in the war, this means he should be the focus of Australian pro-Palestine protesters. Right. Morons walk among us, folks. Taking on Seinfeld on stage in Sydney with a microphone in his hand? That's a very silly thing to do. A genius, ladies and gentlemen. He solved the Middle East. He solved this. It's the Jewish comedians. That's who we have to go. They're the ones doing everything. Yeah, go ahead, keep going. They're going to start punching you in about three seconds. So I will try and get all of your genius out so we can all learn from you. It's a comedy show, you moron. Get out of here. Stop the red back to the stage. Follow the line of the stage. Stop the red back to the stage. That's okay. Yeah, this is so important. Imagine, by the way, imagine if this guy actually did solve the cut. <laughs> yes, so you're, you're really influencing everyone here. We're all. We're all on your side now because you have made your point so well. And it's in the right venue, you come to the right place for a political conversation. Tomorrow we will read in the paper, Middle East 100% solved thanks to man at the Kudos Arena stopping Jew comedian. They stopped him 
and everyone in the Middle East went, oh my God, let's just get along. We can't do that. Because I know there are problems here with uh, indigenous Aboriginal people and the white people. They have problems here. So maybe to solve that, I will screw up Jim Jeffries in a show in New York. <laughs> if this works, that will work. You have to go 20,000 miles from the problem and screw up a comedian. That is how you solve world issues. Now, that was uh, Seinfeld's Sunday night Sydney show. Then some other tedious bores interrupted thousands of people's night out at the second Sydney show at a different venue on Tuesday night, as 10 News reported. It has happened again. US comedian Jerry Seinfeld's show has been targeted by more demonstrators who held up a Palestinian flag mid-gig. The demonstrators shouted, shame on you, Seinfeld, and free Palestine, as they were booed by the audience before police escorted them outside. Some people just never learn. If you want to make your point, don't make it when people are trying to get to work or having a nice night out. Leave traffic and the arts alone. It'll only backfire on you, always. Speaking of being independent from reliance upon China too much, that's not something it seems concerns the Albanese government terribly much. One thing left-wing Western governments don't get about China and the CCP is that they do not respect weakness, nor kowtowing. They see it as a green light to actually double down and take advantage when other parties grovel. And we have done so much groveling to win back access to Chinese markets for some of our banned goods, it's embarrassing. Australian journalist Chung Lei was imprisoned in Beijing for almost three years. I'll just repeat that so it really sinks in. Australian imprisoned in Beijing for almost three years on trumped up national security charges and torn from her family in Melbourne. She was released earlier this year and now works for Sky News Australia. But surprisingly, even here on Australian soil, the Chinese communist authorities think they can control her movements. And it seems they can. Chinese diplomats stood in front of her to try to block her from TV cameras during Anthony Albanese's news conference with China's Premier Li Chiang at Parliament House in Canberra earlier this week. Here's how ABC News covered it Tuesday. They made several very blatant attempts to try and block Chung Lei from the cameras. Camera operators there in the heart of Parliament House were essentially trying to get a shot of her in the same room as the Premier. That was obviously something that the Chinese officials did not want to happen, and so they physically tried to block the shots. That really infuriated not just journalists, but also Australian officials who felt that that behaviour was entirely inappropriate. In the end, because the Chinese officials wouldn't move, Chung Lei essentially had to move to the front row. After that, we saw a situation where those shots could in fact be made, but the entire affair was really unfortunate. Albert tried to laugh the incident off, calling it a ham-fisted attempt by Chinese officials to obstruct her and rude and inappropriate. But there was no serious addressing of the issue or how much an affront and insult it is to our nation to do that on our soil. Peter Dutton rightly told Albanese to grow a backbone and stand up for our country. But then Chiang Lei was later blocked at the Chinese embassy and not allowed to cover Dutton's meeting with Premier Chiang either. That situation is a bit different because technically the Chinese embassy is Chinese soil. But Chiang said she was also kept out of the opening remarks of the Dutton meeting at the Hyatt Hotel beforehand. She said an Australian official was the one who told her that she would not be allowed to go in. You may be surprised to learn, or maybe not, that no Australian journalists were allowed to ask Premier Lee a question during his visit. Oh no, can't face questions if you're a communist. The whole thing falls apart if you have to answer any actual questions. This is why I love the left so much. They, they never want to shut down free speech. And they open themselves up to interrogation all the time and their wonderful ideology can stand up to scrutiny. Oh yes. Sadly, Chung Lei wrote in a piece on the Sky News website that, quote, some of her Aussie business contacts went silent after the story broke, and she wondered if all the Canberra bureaucrats were annoyed at her. What we can be sure of is that there are plenty in business and politics in Australia 
dependent on that wonderful China money. And they'll excuse any behaviour of the communist regime, whether it's running roughshod over the rights of people in formerly British Hong Kong and jailing innocent protesters, or the one million Uyghurs rounded up and put into concentration camps in the most horrific move of its kind since the Second World War, or the jailing of innocent Australians in China on trumped up charges. But shh, we mustn't upset the big customer. With all these like that all over the place, China doesn't need to send its own goons in. We have our own gutless Australian sellouts who'll take care of any China critics here at home without China having to lift a finger. Hey, just a reminder that The uh, Other Side is available to watch every Friday night from 8pm on ADH TV and YouTube. And if you'd like to support us, the best way is to subscribe to our channel on YouTube. It's free. Just hit the subscribe button and the little bell too. That will notify you when we post anything. Also, if you're feeling generous, feel free to send us a super thanks donation. You can do that by clicking the little dollar sign thanks icon under the video frame on YouTube. You can also follow us on X. That's Twitter at other side Oz, A-U-S. It all helps. Bruce Lerman was back in court this week facing a committal hearing on whether there's enough evidence in a new rape case against him for it to actually go to trial. Lerman had to appear in the magistrate's court in his home city of Toowoomba, west of Brisbane. Here's a quick snippet of how Seven News reported that. Arriving this morning, the former Liberal staffer fronted cameras for the first time since his failed defamation case against Lisa Wilkinson and Network 10. He was charged in December 2022 with the matter mentioned in court for the first time in January 2023. His identity was concealed until Queensland legislation was amended in October last year. So anyway, we're, we're supposed to have this principle of law in Australia called subjudice. It's a contempt of court thing. Subjudice means under judgment. Uh, I can't tell you stuff or comment about stuff that's related to a trial that is underway from the time that someone's charged to when the trial process is completely finished. There's a lot of stuff related to this new rape charge in the Queensland city of Toowoomba against Bruce Learman that we'd love to be discussing, but we'll just have to wait. Fair enough, I guess. The idea is to prevent any potential jurors in a trial from being tainted by media coverage. But I sure wish the principle would be applied fairly and universally. The left-wing leaning nine media newspapers, the City Morning Herald, The Age and The Brisbane Times, ran a very long article on the Lerman story this past week, which technically didn't say too much. Boy, it sure had a tone about it that did. So I think it might be fair for us to balance things out just a little bit by just saying that nobody should be jumping to any conclusions in all of this. It actually means absolutely nothing that a high-profile person caught up in one scandal might find themselves the subject of a second or third claim against them. It does not mean that we can say, oh, well, two claims or, or three claims now. Well, oh, he, oh, well, he must be. Oh, yes. Why doesn't being accused two or three times of doing something mean it's more likely that someone is guilty of a thing? Well, firstly, it is possible to be falsely accused multiple times, even if you're an ordinary person. But secondly, if you're already high-profile, and you've been accused of something, it could be an actual incentive for someone else to come along and have a go if they believe that there might be some benefit in it for them. Now, we can't say anything about the Learman Toowoomba case, and we are not, but nor should any other media. The court is now deciding whether there is enough evidence to send this case to trial. It heard from the accuser in a closed door hearing this week that Learman attended, and his lawyers are seeking to have the matter tossed out for lack of evidence. But that is now up to the magistrate. Until then, we would all be wise to be slow to make much comment at all or make any rush to pre-judgment yet. But when it's over, oh, we'll have plenty to talk about. One of my favorite current comedians and impersonators is the brilliant Ami Kozak. Nobody does Jordan Peterson like this guy. He also does Donald Trump brilliantly and RFK Jr. Well, this week, Ami has put all three of them into one sketch. Donald Trump, Jordan Peterson, and RFK Jr. walk into a bar. Yes, sir. What can I get you to drink? Well, you know, I don't drink at all, actually. Alcohol is a terrible thing. Terrible thing when it's done to people. Done terrible things. But what about you, sir? I'll actually just have a sparkling water, provided it's been subject to a blind study, non-placebo trial. Okay. And would you like a drink? <laughs> well, I don't know what that means. You know, would you like a drink? What will you be having? 
encapsulating, embracing, you know? It's not a question as to whether it's refreshing, it's whether it's useful, you know? So, right, okay. Make it a steak. A steak? And grind it up into a liquid so I can drink it. Wow. Make it a Trump steak, Jordan. You're gonna enjoy it, that I can tell you. Mmm, I suppose. And just make sure whatever you're serving was made in America. Got it. So there was a big peace summit involving 90 countries in Switzerland the past weekend to try to stop the bloodshed in Ukraine and bring an end to the conflict there. The idea was to get enough countries together to pledge their support for Ukraine so that Russia would have to just accept that its invasion of the country has failed. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraine. Eighty of the countries that attended signed the final communique calling for the territorial integrity of Ukraine to be the foundation of any peace agreement to end the war. The summit was Ukraine initiated. Putin wasn't invited and China decided not to send anyone. India, Saudi Arabia and the UAE were among 10 countries that did not sign the final communique. But 80 did. The Ukrainian foreign minister says Kiev is willing to talk to Moscow. Here's how Radio Free Europe reported that. Well, that's the idea, that the, the next summit should uh, be uh, the end of the war, and should mean the end of the war. And of course, we need the other side to be at the table. I cannot tell you when the war will end. It's not in my hands. But I know that we are making some major steps towards restoring just and lasting peace. These are two key words, just and lasting. We're not good. peace at any expense. A just and lasting peace, not peace at any expense, he says. I'm wondering how much more expense either side can handle. The human toll of this war has been obscene for two so-called modern European nations who consider themselves advanced. It's utterly shameful. I know it's kind of cool these days to point to Western corruption in Ukraine, particularly US corruption, as if that can excuse Putin marching across the border of a sovereign country. Putin is an illegitimate dictator of an authoritarian communist state. He's not a democratically elected leader of a liberal democracy. He's a murderer and he bumps off his political opponents in true Soviet KGB style. All the mafia stuff that all good people should still detest, even while recognising the flaws and corruption in our own countries and our own imperfections. We can also sympathise with the fact that the deal was always, after the Cold War ended, that the encroachment of NATO closer and closer to Russia would not happen. And Putin doesn't want NATO right on his western border, thanks very much. But this war has been a major failure for Putin, a huge error of judgment and an act of obscene arrogance. He sent hundreds of thousands of his country's young men to the slaughter in the name of ego and hubris. Of the 600,000 plus lives lost in this shameful global catastrophe, it's likely as many as 500,000 are Russian. In its third year of the war, Russia now controls about one-fifth of Ukrainian territory. The original invasion plan was to take Kiev within weeks. And that didn't turn out so well. On the day before the peace conference last Friday, Putin laid out his latest proposal for an end to the war. But it comes with a laundry list of conditions. The Russian leader is demanding that Kyiv withdraw all forces from Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia in eastern and southern Ukraine, four regions annexed by Moscow in 2022. That report from Canada City News Network. Russia is, of course, also insisting that the Ukraine halts any plans to join NATO permanently. But the Ukraine called the offer manipulative and absurd, while the U.S. Defense Secretary had this to say. He is not in any position to dictate to Ukraine um, what they must do to, to bring about a peace. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin says Putin himself could end the conflict by removing troops from Ukrainian sovereign territory. Anyway, at least uh, things seem to be moving in the right direction. So how does all of this affect Australia? Well, first, we need to understand how it affects Russia. Peter Zehan is an American author and expert in geopolitics. He holds degrees in political science and is the author of the bestsellers The Absent Superpower, Disunited Nations and The End of the World is Just Beginning. He spoke to the UK Times newspaper's Times Radio about the risks that Russia faces if it loses more troops in this war. Keep in mind, the Russians had 8 million men in their 20s, or at least that's what they started the war with. 
If they've lost a half a million now, and a million have fled, that still leaves them with six and a half million bodies to throw at this problem. And to be perfectly blunt, the Russians have yet to fully mobilize. Most of the people that they've brought in through their draft system have been minorities from ethnically disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged areas. They haven't really gotten into the core of what the country is capable of. That's still ahead of us. But at this rate, there's no way the Russians can keep this up for another eight years. And I know that sounds like a long time. It is. But remember two things. Number one, the Russians never fight short wars. They do short intimidations. Their wars are always long because they're always about human waves. Number two, if they do this, this is their last war because there aren't enough Russians under age 20 to theoretically repopulate the system. So when this is done one way or another, Russia is done. That's Peter Zihan, American author and expert in geopolitics on the UK's Times Radio there. So again, what, what has all this got to do with Australia? Well, if Russia completely depletes its ability to mount an army, that is very bad news for China. Here's how the popular infographics show YouTube channel explains it. From a strategic point of view, China would be very lonely on the world stage. The loss of Russia as a serious partner and deterrent to the West would shift the balance of power away from China. China would be left with Iran and North Korea as the top allies against the United States, Great Britain and all of NATO. A situation like this is something that she is desperately trying to avoid. Indeed. You see, China is heavily reliant upon Russia for its military strength. With how the Chinese handled the Tiananmen Square situation in 1989, China has been under an arms embargo and hasn't been able to buy or sell anything of military value to the West ever since. This newfound Chinese military industrial complex has only accelerated under President Xi, who stresses Chinese self-sufficiency and seems likely to continue down that path. Their partnership with Russia continues to get deeper and deeper, bleeding into all sectors of the economy. Without global clout, China's huge Belt and Road initiative to build global trade supremacy would be thrown into turmoil. Its persecution and incarceration of more than a million ethnic minority Uyghur Muslims will finally meet international resistance that it should. And their plans to take over Taiwan will be severely curtailed. All of that takes a lot of pressure off Australia geopolitically, so it would be a plus. But it also means that China may suffer economically, which would impact us negatively economically, in the short term at least. The Taiwanese defense is outfitted with state-of-the-art radar systems, as well as some assistance from the U.S. government's satellites and drones. If everything is operational, they'll see any invasion coming from a long way off. The only real chance the PLA has here is a coordinated strike with cyber attacks that blind Taiwan and the U.S. radar and reconnaissance devices. If PLA troops were able to make it ashore, they would face a fortress of defensive works. The Taiwanese have spent the last few decades rearming and preparing to defend their island against what seems like an inevitable invasion. Another major roadblock to Chinese ambition is the United States' bases and forces, which are always within striking distance of Taiwan. The United States military has several bases around Taiwan in countries such as the Philippines and Japan. In 2014, the U.S. signed the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement EDCA, with the Philippine government, which allowed the U.S. to build nine military bases, rotate troops through the country, and train local forces. Japan has a similar agreement, and the U.S. has about 20 bases currently in the country. More recently, U.S. Special Forces units have been rotating through some of the small islands surrounding Taiwan. It's a mystery to me why China's President Xi is so obsessed with taking Taiwan. I mean, who cares? If we all just get on with business and trade, everyone will prosper. Let's hope common sense prevails in Beijing. But in the end, nobody can really know what Russia or China will do, nor how Putin might react if things get very bad for him. Well, now we're going to get kind of controversial on the show. Uh, natural law expert, millennial, classical, liberal, all-round good guy, and uh, other side regular commentator Rob McMullen joins us in the studio, mate. It's good to see you. Absolutely. It's good I to be here. I wanted to get you in to talk a little bit about uh, a very sensitive topic that's somewhat risky to talk about, but the feminization, uh, and we're not talking about 
women specifically, but just the general feminization of Australian culture, Australian politics, Australian law, Australian everything, um, and the impact that that's having on our culture. Uh, but first, a drinking game. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was what I was going to open with. I identified a new drinking game, and I'm ready, actually, because you might have thought this was a long black, but it's, it's heavily laced. Oh, okay. It's heavily Fair laced enough. with a good single malt. No, not yeah. really. But you can take a shot every time a Labour politician's social media profile is laid out something like father to, husband to, passionate squash player, Oh, and I happen to be the minister for blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> by the way, I have this really responsible adult grown-up role too. <laughs> That's right. Um, let's have a look at some of these. I mean, I can't believe, I can't believe it. You put them all together. It just cracks me That's up. That's right. But let's have a look at the Chris Bowen one first of all. Uh, so the first thing that Chris Bowen's profile says, this is on Twitter, I assume, says uh, husband to Beck, dad to Grace and Max, and then minister for climate change and energy, living on the land of the Cabrogal people of the Darug Nation, Lover of Labradors. Aww. How adorable. Oh, how adorable you are. Isn't that Chris what Bowen. matters? Hey? Isn't that uh, what Queensland matters? Premier Chuckles Miles. Let's have a look at his. Oh, yeah. First of all, he's a husband. He's a husband before he's anything else. That's right. Dad of three. Broncos fan. Oh, well, dude, that's almost not allowed. Uh, <laughs> uh, blah, blah, blah. Queensland's new Premier. Yeah, okay. And Jason Clare, MP. Uh, Atticus and Jack's dad. Okay, Louise's husband, all right. Minister for Education, blah, blah, blah. Why, what's so bad about this? I mean, why is this a thing and why do we, should, should we even give a damn? Well, the frequency with which that same formula was used, it just looked to me like the hashtag care social media TM package has been, <laughs> you know, filtered down from social media HQ. You know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. the cynical... Um, look at me, you know, feely feels like I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a dad, I love my Labradors. That's more important than my responsibilities to society almost yeah, because it right. comes first. And you would define that as kind of the traditional masculine side of what I do for a living as a, as a contributor to, to the world, my output, my masculine output versus my well, feminine nurturing sort of side. You know, there's, there's the idea that there's our personal lives and there are our societal and professional lives. And um, it's a bit of a stereotype, but I think, you know, the feminization, it, it, it lives in around the home and the home life. Whereas as a, as a fairly red-blooded male, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, what, how are you going to run society properly? That's more my prerogative. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> what know? we're employing them to do. We're not employing them to tell that's us right. how much of a great husband yeah. or, or, or we're not marrying them, I suppose. That's right. The award has to go, though, to Tony Burke. Oh, Tony Burke. We've, we've got to put Tony Burke up. This <laughs> is a classic, man. The first thing he says is Sky's husband, dad and stepdad, Labor MP, in spare time, guitar, piano, poetry, theatre. Love poetry and theatre myself, but, you know... There, yeah, that's not really what I'd be putting on my profile. Kayaking and national parks. Uh, okay, whoop de doo um, But yeah, here it is. It's like a, it's, it's, it's a little emasculating, right? To say I'm, could you imagine? I mean, let's just put this in drive. There's a lot of women out there probably going raging at us right now, but just stop for a minute, ladies. We mean well, ladies. And, and let's have a little think about this for a second. Imagine if the first thing that we thought you should put on your thing was Rob's wife or Damien's wife, you know, instead of... <laughs> Instead of what you do for a living. Imagine leading that with a CV for a professional job. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, the first thing you should know about me is that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Rob <laughs> McMullen's wife. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, yeah, it's not going to work. So, okay, so it's a little bit emasculating. It sort of speaks to a cultural shift that has occurred in Australia, which a lot of people might say is a nice touchy-feely thing, but it has a dark side. Well, look, that's the thing with virtue signalling is that you can hack the virtue because it's just a signal. You don't necessarily need to be demonstrating the virtues you're putting forward. Right. Um, and so that was another thing I wanted to talk about is as, as interesting, I'll say silly as I find it, leading with the personal lives in the professional sphere. Um, you know, I think you go to, go to work for a, a, bunch of, a bunch of guys and it's, it's good to keep the personal at home. Like it's great for the people in your life. But in the professional or political sphere, in the sphere that we're paying taxes for these people to do these jobs, that's not the first thing that I need from them. No. I really need the job done well. Yeah. And so 
and then we get into that area of virtue signaling. Well, you know, they're, they're signaling this uh, personal feel good uh, personability, is that the word? You know, they're, they're bringing their personal lives to make people feel good and, and connect with them on a personal level. Um, but as a virtue signal, like I said, the reality doesn't necessarily have to match up with what they're signaling. And, and it quite often doesn't. It quite often doesn't. And, and I thought it was interesting to juxtapose that with the reality in Australia for people who want to have families or right. who have young families. And unfortunately, despite all the, the cynical social media virtue signaling, the reality is often quite different for people who have families under labour. Well, you are a millennial, middle class, small business person, successful but small business person, uh, average middle class sort of uh, income. Uh, you know, you're successful, you're doing well, but you're feeling the pain of trying to have a young family or having a young family in Australia in this time and owning a home. Well, I think a lot of people are is the point. You know, a lot of people are. And, um, you know, the first thing I, I pointed to is there's been so much talk about birth rates. Um, if, can we go there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how cynical to, to for these p politicians to signal, well, I'm somebody's dad and I've got a family, but the reality is that less people than ever before are actually having families. Let's have a look at these birth rates. Let's have a look at the chart now. This is a chart from uh, IFM, an investment group, IFM Investors. Coral, uh, they put data together from uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the World Bank. Uh, and they've come out with a number that's pretty startlingly low and a bit lower than other estimates, but it's, it's, saying, it's a legitimate um, analysis they've done here. And they're saying that the birth rate is 1.06 now. Now, 1.06 means that uh, every year per 100 people in Australia, there are 1.06 births. And that is not a sustainable replacement level. Like you've got to be at about 2.2 or 2.1 to be replacement. 2.1. Right. Okay. So it's sort of like one to replace mum, one to replace dad, and point one for that's right for, for to cover any uh, problems that might occur on the way. Um, and we used to be at around. If you look at back, this chart goes back to nineteen fifties. So it used to be around about two point three, just under two point three, uh, coming down to the two level at around about nineteen seventy five, and then just plummeting since. And now we here we are at, at sort of one, which means we're going to die out in a couple of generations. Uh, original Australians, at least. You know, uh, well, when I say original Australians, uh, I better clarify that. But yeah, I mean, that's right. You know, Australians probably, if you would say, were you know second generation or more. Yeah. Right. Uh, families. Well, you know, as, as we have it now, we have a native Australian population. Um, you know, we have Australians now, and they're not having sufficient children to sustain the nation. Um, and so, obviously, the Labor are reacting. Labor are reacting to this by bringing in record numbers of migrants to keep the population up. But I mean, that's gonna have a whole array of, of um, effects and it's gonna create dra drastic changes to the country. So- Let's have a look at that too. Australian net overseas migration chart, this one from Macro Business. And um, I mean, everyone's been talking about this, but we are at net migration of uh, 520,000 plus for 2023 or 500, I had the exact number there somewhere, here we go. Uh, so our population now is 26.97 million. That was at 31 December 2023. So it's definitely 27 million now. Um, that was 2.5% higher than a year earlier. Uh, but the gro growth was driven by net overseas migration of 547,000 in 2023. And net is number of people in minus number of people out. Mm. So it's, you know, it's a pretty high number for one year. Mm. Um, and number of pe new people in, I think, was even higher. It was like 700 and something thousand um, and, and a million uh, in the 18 months, I think, to, to now. So pretty pretty wild number of new people coming into the country. There's only 27 million people and we've got a million new people. Well, it's unprecedented. And I don't know about you, but once I saw past the feel-good virtue signaling of the social media profiles, oh, I'm, I'm ex's dad, I'm someone's husband. Well, the reality being that less people are, are able to have that reality than ever before. It's, right. it's quite shocking. And it's all happening under Labor's management. They're in power almost everywhere. 
Yeah. Um, and there's a variety of economic, social, cultural issues that are contributing to that and that labor actually contribute to. So on one hand, they're virtue signaling about family and family values and the families they have. But on the other hand, they're undercutting so many Australians' ability to have their own families, Right. which I think is shocking. Yeah. So there you go. So the virtue signaling, again, is just a load of rubbish. Absolute uh, rubbish. Poured over a, a serious problem. Uh, Rob, we're talking about this question of sort of net migration going through the roof. We've got Australia's birth rate falling, so we're having massive demographic change. Um, but we're having the population increase when we don't have enough housing. Uh, we're not really taking care. It's got cost of living is going through the roof because governments are spending too much. So we're not actually taking care of families at all, despite no. all this lovely virtue signaling from our our uh, somewhat emasculated, perhaps, uh, <laughs> Labor MPs That's online. Right. Um, how do how do we how do we fix this? What has to change? I mean, if you take something complex like birth rates, there's always a multitude of factors that come into it. But there's a few things I think we could definitely point to. Like you said, most people are not going to have children if they don't have anywhere to put them. And so, you know, Australians want to buy houses, um, and not even just apartments. They want houses. They want a backyard. They don't want iPad apartment children. Mm -hmm. You know. And the levels of immigration we've had are making that harder than ever before. It's mathematically not possible that if you're bringing in more people into the country at a rate faster than we can build houses, then it's going to increase the demand, therefore the cost of housing. Mm, it's mathematically okay. not well, possible. Yeah. And well. also too, you know, they're, they're, a lot of the people they're bringing in will be competing for labour jobs. And so for your average Australian, average working Australian, you know, you might be up in the professional classes or we all know definitely the political classes and, and doing quite well. But if you're in the labor market, there's no way, it's mathematically not possible that bringing in more population is not creating more competition for wages. So your working class Australians are gonna suffer, they're gonna struggle to get those wage increases, you're gonna compete for wage increases. Now, um, the traditional, traditionally the left would say, well, you're anti-immigration and you're, you know, and we need this labour. We need people to come in and work. And we do have some fantastic people here working, thank God, uh, because we do have labour shortages in many, many areas because of other mismanagement. Um, but I think I heard Douglas Murray or somebody saying the other day that, you know, you bring in migrant workers to look after the elderly, to be nurses. And we've got some fantastic migrant workers in Australia in that field. Um, but they get old and then yeah. they need people to look after them and it just keeps that's going right. and that's, that's where right. the uk has sort of gotten itself into this sort of vicious circle i guess um absolutely so it, it you do have to come to a point where you say well what sort of a nation do we want to be right and and what it's are we always what, a short term our... fix isn't it it's always kicking the can down the road um, and it seems like a lot of these, uh, but look, especially the Labor politicians, they can get in, they can virtue signal about their family life and how pro-family they are, get their pay packets and get out. And so, mm. yeah, by the time the migrant workers start aging themselves and, you know, the, it's a Ponzi scheme. It's not their problem. You know, even you talk about the UK, even Nigel Farage is coming out saying the levels of immigration we're having, it's the levels, you know, we've always had some immigration, but it's the levels that we're having currently it's increasing the pricing of housing and it's making people compete harder for, for wages. Let's put that chart back up, the Australian Net Overseas Migration chart. And you can see pretty clearly there, uh, just looking, because it goes back to 1900. And if you look on the left-hand side there, we have zero and then World War One obviously drops down. Um, then it sort of stays pretty much you know, around zero. I mean, there's the spike after the war and then uh, and then you've got World War II where it's flat and then you come into the 50s and we start having, you know, migration at a kind of around the 100,000 level right through until sort of 2010. And we see that spike in 2010 up to about a quarter of a million. So that was the Rudd era, I guess. Um, uh, Rudd Gillard Rudd and mm. uh, Turnbull Abbott Turnbull or whatever the heck it was. Two of our finest prime ministers yep. in the entire history. Um, Thank you, both sides of mainstream politics for those guys. Uh, and now, and then we've got the, the sort of plummeting back to zero during COVID. And then there's just this astronomical explosion in the last 12 months, 18 months. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's being felt, right? People are going to feel that. That's well, not responsible, gradual, sensible, assimilated immigration, is no, it? No, it's not. And like you said, Australians are suffering under the one-two punch of Labor and Liberal. You know, if you look at the extreme left, like the Greens, they're, they're acting under 
this utopian vision that they can take care of everybody and we can all equalize the entire world and we'll all be fine and sing and dance in the fields together, <laughs> you know? But that's not the reality. Um, we can't take care of the entire world. We can take care of a certain amount of people. We can give certain amount of people Western opportunities at a time and that can keep going. But uh, we certainly can't caretake the entire world <laughs> or, or a million a year. Yeah. And um, then labor, um, they're acting up much on the same thing. The labor really seems to represent the bureaucracy to me these days. And so it's good for a lot of government bureaucrats. You know, they have more people to sell programs to. They have more political dependence. Um, but then liberals as well, instead of looking after small business, sole trader people, they really seem to be shifted to looking after big business. And look, the thing is, if you own a utility, if you're selling uh, phones or um, power, or something that everybody can afford, more bodies in a country simply means more profit. But if you're a small business, that's where, or middle class, that's where you're really getting stuck. So it suits the, it suits the extreme left's utopian visions. It suits the, the bureaucracies and it suits the big, big end of town, the big business. But mm. it's once again, it's your working middle class, um, sole trader, small business Australians that are really getting hit. And I've said a lot of times, you know, the middle class is really the more moral class because they're the ones face to face with reciprocity. You know, they're the ones who, if they don't do well at their job, they don't get paid. Right. They don't have subsidies. They're not big enough to get subsidies to stay afloat if they do a bad job. Yeah. You know, so, you know. And they're not small enough to need welfare and be able to that's access right. government welfare. So you've they're got not this. Dependent. So the middle class yeah. are the ones who really are at the coalface of what is, when you're saying they're, they're the, cult, the sort of mo the most moral class, you mean yeah. they're the class that sort of feel the impact of consequences of their behaviour, their reciprocity and natural law theory. Yeah. yeah, yeah. viewers should check out our chat about reciprocity and natural law. But that's in the middle class, in a small business, where you come face to face with that. And, you know, I've always been a huge advocate of small business. I worked in small businesses myself because you're so close to the boss. So if you come from working classes and you go work in a small business, the boss very often will have lunch with you and talk about business. Mm. And you learn so much that you don't learn as a cubicle worker in a big corporation. Well, the left like to sort of paint corporations as evil corporations of the you know, and corporations are big bureaucracies, just like government. They are, in effect, fairly lefty. That's how they operate, yeah. right? I mean, they're yeah. big bureaucratic organisations. They're yeah. removed and detached by their size and power mm. from the impacts of the market. They can have a buffer to the impacts of the market a yeah. lot more than uh, probably small, that obviously small business does. Small business represents the innovator, the entrepreneur, the person who gets up and has a go, tells the boss to go stick it and tries it out on their own. Yep. That person has to be protected. That That is what made the West great, Absolutely. really, is Absolutely. you know empowering little people to go out and say, you know what, I'm gonna have a crack at this on my own, I'm gonna set up my own business, I'm gonna do it slightly differently, and then we get innovation from that, and we grow, and the market grows. And yep. So small business is about much, much more than just you know, uh, being a, a segment of society that we need to look after. It's a, it's the essence of what it means to be a liberal democratic nation. Yeah. That we aren't just a bunch of people yeah. going and working either for massive government bureaucracies or going and working every day for massive corporate bureaucracies. Mm. Uh, and, and that's the, you would think, with Marx always banging on about, you know, the dehumanization of working in a big organization, that that, that would be uh, the very thing that um, you know, yeah, we, we're trying to prevent, yeah. uh, but we're not. We've got government and large corporations working together now mm. to squash that innovation, that independence, that small business spirit, um, because the more regulation mm. the government puts in, the more rules, uh, the, the harder it is for the small business to comply. The only people that can comply are the big businesses, the corporates, and you end up with a world full of corporates and no, no little guys. Absolutely. So. What I want to tie this back to this concept you were talking about, the, and again, this is not about women and men so much. It's the feminization, though. This idea, uh, I quite like the way you think about this, and just if you could explain that, how that that corporate world suits that feminist fem, feminist who well, is feminist in a way, but feminized uh, view of life. Well, you know, we we where we are at in society is, you know, one of the dominant values is empathy. You know, and I always talk about the the. The, the 
cognitive bias with men and women. You know, it's in on average, in general, men bias a little bit towards systems. Women bias a little bit towards empathy. It's not really groundbreaking stuff. Anyone who's honest will tell you they can see that. So it's the compassion. It's, it's and the pragmatism sort of thing coming coming out. So yeah, well, which we, sh we have to have in balance in all of us to a certain extent, right? Yeah. But definitely biased in men towards the systemization and the, uh, yes. the, 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 the yang, I think it would be in Chinese philosophy, and then the yin of the yin of the feminine energy and the- Absolutely. The, and you have to have that in that imbalance in society. Absolutely, well the yin yang is interesting because you've got these two halves, but then there's a, a part of each in the other as well. Oh, the you know, little dot. The little dot. That's what that's for. Yeah, so yeah. it's saying, you know, like we might act in our, in our capitalizing pragmatic masculine but you know we all have uh, a side of us that can appreciate feminine virtues and, and opposite for women too right. so we're not really talking about people we're just talking about what's societally ascendant at the moment is a lot of feminine virtues above all else above all else at right. the exclusion of all else is empathy compassion care and once you get a system like that put in place you get the virtue signals come in and signal through that system whether they they actually believe it themselves or act it out in reality. Well, I didn't bring it with matter. me, but I got a flyer from our local Green federal MP. Federal MP, yeah. she is. Yeah. And the flyer was like all about how nice the trees are and the weather is and blah, 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 and all that's our right. local, and I hope you've been enjoying our local environment, having little walks in the park and everything. It's like, well, that's lovely, but you're the federal member of parliament. That's so right. how about you talk about defence and right. the economy right. and, you know, national security and you know, issues that really matter on a federal, national level and do your job. And she's not capable of that because she's not no. got that component to her personality, knowing her as I do um, yeah. and having met her. Uh, but, I, but I think, you know, this is the issue, right? I mean, we've got a lot of people like that, not just women, but people in the bureaucracy who are very feminized yeah. and who putting the emphasis on these things of compassion and empathy, which is lovely until a masculine entity like China comes along and wants to go squish. Absolutely. Absolutely. Then Look, you need some men. That's right. Look, the masculine systematic thing, we talk about capitalizing, we, you know, getting back to the natural law thing, we have to create capital. I'm talking about all sorts of capital, not just money, but money, because entropy is a force of nature. Everything's always trying to decay. So we need to be putting energy in to maintaining what we've got. And, you know, you talk about um, geopolitics, it's taken as a given in geopolitics that if you are weak, you're incentivizing someone else to act against you. And so in that way, other people, other nations act as a proxy for entropy. You need to keep certain structures in place, otherwise you'll see the negative effects. And that's the importance of the birth rates. So the point with the masculine and feminine thing is that we have feminine virtues of empathy and compassion and never upsetting anybody. but we like to pretend, and especially Greens and Labor, they, they like to pretend or believe in this utopian vision that it, prioritizing those virtues to the exclusion of all else has no cost. It's always got a cost. Look at Thomas Sowell. Mm. You know, conservatives do trade-offs because they're looking at different things. So we need to keep capitalizing. We need to keep our economy strong and competitive. You can caretake to the point where you undermine the competitiveness and the efficiency of society, and that's where we're at. So we've got Labor politicians virtue signaling about their family values and how compassionate and wonderful and empathetic everything is. Nobody can be upset, but the reality is our society is less efficient, less capitalizing, um, and we're seeing the effects. People can't afford homes, people are not having children, and that's gonna have an effect on the competitiveness of our society through time. Mm. All right, Rob, so we're out of time, but to finish up, just you know, you, we, looking at on this show over the past few weeks, the demonization of men, which we're seeing massively uh, with our corrupted mess of a family court system where men are just mm. constantly losing out. Uh, and there just is no other way to put it. I, I, as a journalist, I'm trying to be objective as I can. The stories that I've heard are horrific. We're seeing false accusations on the rise. Um, and that is just a fact. It's just reality. And as as people want to try to deny it, we're hearing a narrative of domestic violence that we turn out turns out doesn't isn't correlated to homicide rates. It doesn't seem to be there. Um, so the, when you look at the data, you don't have that. That's all fear mongering. It's all campaigning. Can I just quickly say so, as well? So you know, on, on? on the one hand, you've got Labor politicians virtue signaling their family values, but then f you did a great segment saying that this fear mongering 
about you know violence against women it doesn't fit the numbers it's been trending down for decades so do you don't think that scaring the crap out of women is going to undermine their confidence to have relationships and marriages and children with men so once again in one in one hand labor saying oh look at these wonderful family values but we're undercutting that same thing well the left have always traditionally been the ones to undercut family values in the family as a social institution because they want the state to be the dominant social institution the government they want everybody married to the government dependent on the government right yeah, yeah. it's not about yeah. being part of the family that's yeah. left this uh marxist theory that's right um so right i get it so but, they're actually doing this on purpose well, <laughs> I'm not undermining sure. the family i don't know um, it just seems it to be seems, coming from a lot of different directions it's an interesting theory that says the purpose of a system is what it does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, we could apply Occam's razor to that and say, well, you know, we can't see into people's minds, but I think most people do want families. They do want happy marriages. They do want great cooperation and reciprocity between men and women. So they'll cynically virtue signal that. Say, look, everything's really nice, really pro-family, pro-family, but what's the reality? We're demonizing men. We're given, um, you know, making harsh economic conditions and it's having negative effects mm. and demonizing religion traditional values all that's that sort right. of thing as well that's right that's right all right mate always good to talk to you great to have you on the Pleasure. show thanks, thanks for bringing those insights to us we really do appreciate it. and that is all we have time for on the other side this week a long episode but well worth the discussion with rob i think and we will catch you guys uh next week same place same time please support us hit that super thanks button and maybe make a small donation if you possibly can that would be great Great. If we get lots of small donations from lots of people, uh, we can continue to do the work that we're doing. So please do support us. We do need that support, I've got to tell you. Um, thanks very much. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.